That Adventures Corp is a potash exploration company focused on the Korat Basin in Thailand, the world's largest undeveloped potash resource. Vatic's management has extensive potash exploration and development experience in Thailand. Vatic will have marketing advantage compared to Western producers. Drill program commences this spring. Vatic trades on the TSX Venture, symbol VCV, and on Frankfurt, symbol V8V2. Visit our website, vaticventures.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council, Incorporated. Welcome back to the show, Danielle. Thank you, Jim. Pot Mania. You have an interesting <laughs> article there uh, on your blog about our people getting in or people investing in the marijuana business uh, hand over fist without really knowing what they're doing or what the risks are? Well, it's not that I uh, don't think that, you know, legalized marijuana or medicinal marijuana is not a, a positive development and a big growth area. It's nothing to do with that. It's strictly to do with the valuation and the period that these um, companies are coming to market in the market cycle. So it's very similar to, you know, in 2007 eight when everyone was talking about the China story and how it was an insatiable demand for commodities in their view and how, you know, these energy and commodity companies could only go higher and higher and that sort of thing. And I was saying, you know, yes, we need those goods. Yes, materials are important. But we're talking about peak in a cycle where valuations have gotten insane, where they're floating on uh, excess liquidity, where, you know, risk seeking has become a national obsession, where people are not doing math or valuing companies. They're just buying because they think it's going higher. And I think that's exactly where we are with uh, the pot um, sector right now. And, um, you know, I'm speaking at the Toronto Money Show this weekend, and I note that the dominant sponsors and the dominant uh, booth buyers, which is essentially who funds those investment conferences, is, you know, cannabis uh, is, a, is a main uh, theme at that show. And I'm just reminiscent of, you know, the tech bubble when tech companies were buying all the booths and sponsoring everything in the financial media uh, in 2000. And the, as I say, the, the commodity China story was doing it, the, the precious metals people in, in the peak of the last cycle. And this time it's definitely, you know, we've had e-commerce, so the, the FANG stocks have been the, the stars leading the parade and, and pulling everything higher while underneath, you know, many companies have not been participating in the new highs in the last year. And then you've got uh, at the same time this whole sector, which is a nascent sector. So, you know, I always say you've got to disconnect the, um, um, the story itself from the valuations that are put on the assets. So, you know, it's very like I love Tesla the car, I don't own Tesla the stock, right? It's very like, um, you know, I was writing in the client letter last fall that blockchain had um, potential, that I could see the rationale for the evolution of the technology, but it didn't mean that cryptocurrencies were likely to be good rewarding investments for people that were piling into them because they were leaping by the day. And, you know, and exactly the, the case, um, when these bubbles burst, it really isn't personal to the issue or the, or the sector involved. It's the behavior around it. It's the debt infusion. It's the mania. It's the overvaluing. Um, that really drives the cycle. So it's common for these things to go parabolic, everybody to believe that they're the, you know, the new wonderkind, and then to have the exact same companies collapse, you know, 70% in value as the mean reversion takes place. Not only that, but because we've had such a debt-fueled rally in everything in the past few years uh, on the on the QE and the and the cheap rates, uh, deregulation and lax lacks oversight, um, you've really got everything leaping together. And, um, you know, at the same time, it, we know that companies have issued the most debt uh, of any of the last several cycles. And typically what happens is that therefore makes them very vulnerable as we go into the slowing growth phase. And so, you know, I think I've mentioned before, it's not good for companies either because, you know, they may have a great idea or a great product, but if they issue too much debt or they get driven too too high and they start doing mergers and acquisitions on this funny money, you know, the paper uh, of their shares, 
what happens is when the when the uh, crunch comes, when the liquidity dries up, many of them fail, and that's exactly what's happening. The average life expectancy, you know, of these startups in this space, whether it be cryptos, whether it be pot, any of these things, uh, the 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 numbers are that over eighty percent of them won't be around in five years. So whenever anyone is, you know, in love with the story and not doing math and just thinking they're going to get rich quick, it's usually a, a, a warning sign for the opposite outcome, which is capital implosion. I was just going to ask, are marijuana stocks just like the cryptocurrencies, uh, a huge bright splash and then a uh, disaster for many? Well, it goes back to what is the legitimate business model revenue expenses, profit forecast, uh, probability for an individual enterprise. What is the management like? You know, how viable is their business? And as I'm saying, even if all those things are possible, are positive, it's also the case that the market will overvalue them. So it's like, you know, again, it doesn't mean, you know, that it doesn't mean that there's no value in e-commerce, for example, but the stocks have got you know, obscenely overvalued on this sort of blind funneling cash into them. And the same thing goes with with the with the pot stocks. Yes, there's going to be some winners. Yes, there's going to be some companies that come out as the leaders who end up being quite profitable. But it is so much uncertainty in that space still. You know, we still have so much, uh, so many things to get through. And you could say, well, I want to be an early investor, and I say, by all means. But if you're investing, do your work. And secondly, control your risk. And don't just pile uh, life savings that you're not prepared to lose into some of these uh, ideas and nascent companies. Because, again, the, the odds are not in your favor. You know, if you're not prepared to take a sum and go to the casino, and, and you know, that's likely equivalent to the amount of risk you're taking if you're piling into these things near, you know, euphoric tops, um, if you're not prepared to lose the money as you would at a casino, then don't put it into, you know, don't put more than that, whatever that X number is for you, don't put more than that into any of these, uh, you know, startups. Also, isn't it too late to be so-called early money? Well, I, I would I would argue no. I think Canada is, you know, uh, got a head start over other countries in this sector. I think that, um, you know, the evolution of where this goes, we haven't even you know, got to the whole edible concept. I mean, we're very new in this business cycle, uh, in this product cycle, let's put it that way. But in terms of the market cycle, in terms of raising capital, in terms of debt levels in, in corporations, in terms of, you know, froth in capital markets, we're really late cycle. So all I'm saying is, you know, what we need to do is always align the market cycle with our aspiration for what we'd like to buy and make sure that we're not just piling in at the peak. So what we, you know, I would suggest that people make a list if they want, if they want to get in, involved in the space, make a list either of the companies that they're interested in, do actual due diligence. Don't just listen to sales pitches of people who seem to be smart or seem to know. Um, or if you're going to buy, you know, like an ETF that has a diverse representation in many of these companies, then, you know, again, look at a chart of how fast that thing has gone up and realize that there's no capital protection typically in any of this stuff when the liquidity waves recede. So once we get into a bear market, Everything drops together. We're talking defensive, so-called defensive bank shares, utilities, dividend-paying stuff, all goes down as well. But typically, you know, a maximum sort of like a 50%, whereas some of this stuff that's, you know, not as established business model doesn't have, um, you know, a lot of the, the question marks answered yet. That That's the stuff that can go down by 70 and 80%. And we see that repeatedly and indeed go bankrupt eventually, even if they had a great idea. We'll have more with Danielle Park right after the break. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030.
Cypress Development Corp's flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Danielle Park. Danielle, what kind of exposure do we have to the uh, crises that we're seeing in the emerging markets where Turkey has now announced their official interest rate has gone up from about 17% to 24%? Yeah, so that's, um, you know, that may, that may help, help the outflows out of their currency because their currency has been crashing. But the difficulty there is they're a highly indebted country and a lot of their debt is owned in foreign currencies and predominantly in the U.S. dollar. So therein lies the rub, right? The, the central banks are, are the government in that case is controlling the central bank, but wherever the central bank is raising rates, ultimately to defend the currency to try and keep them from getting into an inflationary spiral in terms of costs at home. The problem is that their their debt payments are spiking as their currency falls and as interest rates move higher. So you're into a very near, a very real threat of a, a sovereign default. And in fact, we're seeing contagion of that throughout the develop, uh, emerging markets. Emerging market shares are down 20% year to date, and that's just the basket. Countries like China, uh, 25% year to date, you know, so, um, and, and a lot of the US dollar relative to the basket of emerging market currencies is up over 8% year to date. It's up more than 4% against just the Canadian dollar, and we're sort of the, the milder version of this. So, you know, people have to appreciate that one of the fallout of the QEs and the low rates which have been left in place for the last decade is that people have borrowed their brains out all over the world, and we're talking about in every country and because U.S. rates were so low and liquidity was so flowing, they took advantage of that by borrowing in U.S. dollars, not thinking further enough ahead for, hey, you know, this is all great while the dollar's falling and rates are low, but what about late cycle when the Fed starts hiking and the dollar starts appreciating? Then you're getting uh, whacked on both ends in terms of leaping costs and you're just not able to make your payments. At the same time, they're having less global demand for exports, right? We've got the whole uh, trade wars uh, scenario slowing uh, trade um, around the world. And, you know, that hits different countries in different ways. Um, certainly, America is much more insulated from that, as I think we've mentioned in past discussions, because they're just not as dependent on exports to other countries. That's a, a relatively small amount of their business, whereas countries like, you know, uh, Germany is like 47 dependent, the 47 percent dependent on exports. Canada about 30 percent, you know, the U.S. less than 12. So, uh, this is where this whole business of international trade and currency comes to bear on the people that are heavily indebted because they have to keep revenue coming in to try and make the payments. And so this is why everyone's interconnected in this global economy, global financial system, um, because of the interconnectedness of borrowing in other people's currencies, buying debt off other governments, you know, this sort of thing. You've really got a, a very susceptible to a, a, a contagion as it starts to spread. And I think we're seeing a lot of that right now. Um, and then to think that North America can be an island, can decouple, can, you know, avoid the impacts of that, I think is extremely naive. And if we look at past cycles, that's never been the case. So I think it's all, you know, a warning sign. Uh, when we see places like China, the Chinese government, you know, encouraging companies to buy back their own shares, you realize that they're just following the American playbook. And once they've run out of that, once we're at, you know, peak valuation, once people have got as many payments as they can possibly, um, you know, maintain, and they start to default, you know, the, the dominoes go the other way. And I think that's where, you know, that's what we're overdue with. We've got the longest uh, expansion cycle in the equity market that's ever happened. Uh, you know, these are not just meaningless superlatives. Uh, ultimately, the business cycle comes back and the piper must be paid. We'll have more with Danielle Park right after this.
Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Daniel Park. Again, Danielle, one of the questions is if you think the equity market is near the top and that a lot of those stocks are already falling where should a person be parking their money and still trying to grow something with it? Well, this is, you know, this is the whole thing that people have to get their minds around. You cannot perpetually buy and hold overvalued assets and expect to do well over time, right? So we've had this central bank gift, if you will, that extended this market cycle probably five years past where it would have been otherwise because the thing turned down in 2012 and that was when the ECB came to the rescue with you know, uh, more QE and promising to do it indefinitely and all that stuff. So they really had an extension on this cycle of about five years of uh, gains that probably would never have happened organically. So when you when you find yourself in facts such as those, you have to appreciate that you can't just stay gorging at the buffet forever and not expect to get harmed. And that's where we are. So people have a hell of a time pulling back because they're afraid of missing out or more likely in many cases they're, they've set up a income withdrawal demand on capital without any appreciation of the risk they've put it at. So instead of saying, what can I earn safely on the money? I'll live on that. They say, I want to earn X on the money and therefore they put themselves into the riskiest assets to try and collect that. So that's something that you can do after assets have sold off. Uh, and have come down heavily and dividend yields are higher and capital risk is a fraction of what it is today, but it is not something that you can do safely when, as I say, valuations are off the charts and, and we're at late cycle. So the best thing to do is to pull back your risk before the masses do because the masses all do it when prices have crashed and things are falling and they're in a panic. They sell and they lock in losses. What you don't want to do is that. So you have to really be prepared to move ahead of the pack to pay down your debt, to build up your liquid savings, cash, GIC deposits, things that will not be impacted when the flows move out and the stock market begins to decline. Um, corporate debt is not something you can stay in late in a cycle and expect it to do well. Even things like preferred shares that people are holding thinking they've got some kind of a safe income instrument, you again, you have to face the facts that people have overbought them in this low rate environment, that banks have overissued all in preferable terms for themselves, perpetual due dates and all this sort of thing. And what happens is they get a liquidity crunch and they also get sold off. So what you need to do is be prepared to buy them when everyone else so we got to pick up things like preferred shares and bank shares and utility shares for 50% off in the last two down cycles, and I believe that's coming again. So you don't want to be the one holding them while they fall 50%. You want to be the one buying them after they've gone down 50%. And that's when the real value of every cycle comes. That's when the least risk, best returns, and highest income are available. So to, to get to there, you have to think now ahead defensively and not expect things to decouple. Because as I say, these things are all highly correlated because of the same globalization, financialization, debt, and investor attitudes all around the world. Um, they've moved as a pack, and they will all sell off probably about the same time as well. That's when you want to be able to act and take advantage of it. Is it human greed that's keeping a lot of folks in? They know that's the right thing to do, but they just don't want to miss out on that last 5 or 10%. 
I find that people are very susceptible to each other. So, uh, you know, we are a, a, a pack-driven species. There's been multitudes of tests and studies done to prove this over time. But even people of strong mental fortitude will succumb to the madness of crowds if it goes on long enough, if their buddy is talking, if their neighbor's made money, if someone, you know, seems to be, you know, getting a, getting away with something. It, it's a very enticing idea that pulls on our mental strength and finally we succumb. So even, you know, um, Sir Isaac Newton succumbed in, in the, you know, in the uh, South Sea bubble. Uh, you know, he bought early, made 200% left. He left and then the thing went parabolic. And while all the people around him seemed to be making a fortune, he finally, you know, buckled and made an emotional bet, which was to take a, a big amount of his capital and put it back in just as everything collapsed. So we have to be very aware that that's our tendency and that we're very susceptible to people who seem smart or to have the inside scoop on something. So typically when someone's, you know, speaking about a company that they're selling to the public or executives within the company, you know, they talk in a way that seems very appealing to a lot of people. And, and you know, that's all fine and well, but you have to think about it from the perspective of what is your point in doing it. You know, the, the people who are already owning the shares or running the companies are there to sell the story, to sell the shares to other people. But if you're an investor, your point is you're wanting to collect an income, not lose the principal, and hopefully see some gain over time. So you have to really have to do it in a mere, uh, mere opposite to what the sales crowd is is trying to get us to do. Danielle, thank you so much for chatting with us. Hey, thank you, Jim. And good luck at the Toronto Money Show. Thank you. My guest has been Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. If you have any questions for Danielle or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.